Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's time for Word Balloons edition of the Big Bout Podcast. John Suntress here. A uh, big, exciting weekend in boxing. Lots of great matchups. But, of course, the Ukrainian-Russian conflict also hangs over our heads, not only as people of concern about what's happening internationally, but also how it's impacting uh, the fight business. There are tremendous fighters that are currently fighting that are Ukrainian. Uh, we had Viktor Polstol. Also in a matchup uh, this weekend, we discussed that. But, uh, geez, the Klitschko brothers, Lomachenko, uh, Alexander Usyk, just to name a few, some of boxing's biggest stars uh, are impacted by this international conflict. Not the first time it's happened in boxing. And uh, felt it was worthy of a discussion in a broader sense and also talking about uh, the current situation with Russia, Ukraine, and how it's impacting these fighters and more. So I decided to uh, tap my uh, buddy Nigel Collins, the editor-in-chief formerly of Ring Magazine, great contributor to Ringside Seat Magazine, Bill Detloff's excellent publication with Mike Cronenberg and the crew, and uh, Nigel's got great perspective. Again, not the first time that a, a world-class fighter has faced this kind of international conflict, uh, either in his own home country or really from a global standpoint as well. And we talk about some of the historic uh, times where fighters were impacted about what was happening during uh, world wars and also uh, national wars. So that's the uh, subject for this discussion on today's Big Bout podcast. This is a special edition of Word Balloon and the Big Bout podcast. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome Nigel Collins back, former editor-in-chief of Ring Magazine, uh, incredible boxing uh, writer, Hall of Fame boxing writer, and of course uh, currently on assignment with Ringside Seat along with his uh, own uh, uh, books. Uh, we've had him on before to talk about his uh, his travels uh, uh, around the world uh, 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 in the drug trade, if you will. And, uh, and of course, his wonderful essays on boxing as well. It's great to see you, Nigel. Good. See you, too. Thank you, man. And thanks for uh, coming on tonight. You know, it was a big weekend in boxing. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, God, I mean, starting off with the big, uh, the big uh, close split decision that Josh Taylor walked away with a lot of people scratching their heads over that uh, decision. Uh, your thoughts on that fight? Um, I thought it was a very bad decision. Um, do you remember when um, Ray Beltran went to Scotland to fight Ricky Burns? He knocked Ricky Burns down. He broke his jaw and uh, Hey, they gave him a draw. Yeah. So that seems to be that that was even worse in a way, uh, you know, because obviously if you get your jaw broken, you're really getting the crap beat out of you. So I I thought it was a terrible decision. Um, I do think that uh, Catterall was a little either too tired to fight hard the last few rounds or his corner said, play it safe. And that's always stupid. You Absolutely. Know, it's safe. No, and if you knock him out, that's great. But yeah, I and, and you know, usually the the British uh, TV announcers are real homers, but they 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 express their feelings for the first time ever, I think. And uh, of course, there's been an uproar without throughout the boxing industry. I, I saw a quick note today that said something like the British Boxing Board Board of Control are going to investigate or something. That's going to come to nothing. Of course, it won't. Yeah, I yeah. But I mean, the thing is. Um, I, I'm, Trish Dixon uh, ran a little poll on the internet today. He said there was a, whether they competent, crooked, or both. I think most of it is crooked. I think, you know, there may be 75% that's crooked and 25% is ignorance and incompetence. And they shouldn't have even been judging the fights anyway. So I'm very hard on officials <laughs> because saw, yeah. these, these guys' livelihood is in their hands. Couldn't agree um, more, man. Uh, you know, so anyway, I, I, I thought uh, also Marcus McDonald, the referee, one of the worst I've seen in years. I mean, he obviously thought that there was like, you know, 13,000 people came to see him. I mean, before like the point deductions, the constant interfering and lecturing. Yes. Talk about officious. I, I, I don't understand why that man was in there on such a big fight. Uh, I don't think either of the uh, penalties were anything, uh, you know, uh, serious, you know, no, 
no pain, no foul, or whatever the, the saying is. And, and I, I think that uh, they started out with that guy, and we had to suffer through him for 12 rounds, and then we had to suffer through two incompetent and or crooked judges. And it, it was amazing. I mean, and, and, you know, the Scottish fans were cheering at the end. I tell you, as you know, I'm a Philly guy. And yes, you know, I came up uh, through Philadelphia, and I'm still very connected with the boxing world. When an out-of-towner gets screwed in Philly, the fans don't like it one bit. They're not going to cheer. They're going to boo. And I've been in a couple of fights. I don't know if you read about them, where there have been riots uh, over things like that. And uh, I kind of like riots, but I'm kind of crazy. But um, it's, it's, it's such a dangerous, hazardous sport. And you give so much of yourself. And let's face it, 90% at least are going to have some form of brain damage when it's over. For crying yeah. out loud, treat them like they should be treated. Agreed. And uh, not as just, you know, bums. I'm with you, man. No, you know, my fear last fall when – Alexander Usyk uh, beat Anthony Joshua right. in the decision. I was expecting a draw there and a hometown decision. I don't remember if the judges were British. There was one Brit, there was one American, and I forget the third judge. Yeah, I, yeah, but I, I but I did fear that kind of hometown decision. Yeah, um, there there didn't seem to. There was a big crowd. Uh, I think that the audience pretty soon got the idea that you know. Usyk was probably going to win. And oh, God, yeah. I, I think if it had been a closer fight with some knockdowns or somebody being staggered a lot, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that was good. I mean, listen, every time there's a bad decision, there's a good decision, but the bad ones stand out far more because a good decision is what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> 100%, man. Well, and yeah. again, it, de it delegitimizes the sport. Yeah, it's it a broken record how many times it happens, right. but it's you're right. No, I'm with you, man. And I understand that blue horizon kind of uh, attitude that you have being a Philly guy and everything as far as, you know, give us a good show and give us a fair show. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, and then the Showtime card was, uh, God, pretty amazing. Two upsets. I picked the wrong upset. I was I was really rooting for uh, Victor Postal to uh, to pull it out because as, as great as, as – or as interesting as a prospect that Russell is in the middle fight, um, I think uh, Postal showed flaws, even in his inability to get a consistent rhythm going. Well, it, as soon as I saw that was the match, I knew who was going to win because Postal's not what he used to be. Yeah. yeah. Who is? Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. he's, I, I, he, he looked like a skinny <laughs> toothpick in there. He sure uh, did. Trying to hold a guy off with a, a dusting rag or something. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't looking forward to it. The other two fights were great. Amazing. And if you got two out of three in a show that are really great fights that you're going to remember for a long time, uh, that's good. You know, you know I'm, it, you. That, that I'm satisfied with that. No, very entertaining. Uh, and again, uh, yeah, great outcomes and, and fair and, and legitimate upsets. And that's great. It's, there's not, I was, I was there for the upset back in the early nineties when James Tony shocked Michael Nunn, right. uh, in, in, in the quad cities. And, uh, I, I let my, uh, my, my excitement, uh, yell in the press box and everyone looked at me and I'm like, Hey, we got a story. No, this is good. That's what I mean. Sorry. I didn't mean to cheer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you get carried away. Um, I tell you, I I sometimes occasionally now go to fights where I'm not working. Not too often, but what I miss is cheering. I mean, bef before I was part of the business, I'd be yelling in instructions and cursing out the ref, <laughs> all sure. that kind of stuff, which is way how you released your your stress, <laughs> you know, by yelling yes. and screaming at sporting events. And, uh, you know, that's gone away now. <laughs> and I've got to be a good boy. Right. We got to be pros. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In the press. No, no, no. Absolutely, man. That's uh, you're right about that. Well, and that's kind of why I feel in my current capacity, I could be fan knowledgeable fan rather than right, right. worry about being yeah. a pro anymore and stuff. Uh, so. The two great fights on that card, uh, you know, uh, Martinez and, and Canas. Yeah. Canas fought the wrong fight. 
he couldn't stand toe to toe with that guy and trade shots. It made for a fantastic fight for the audience and the viewers at home. But uh, you would think after a few rounds of, you know, losing the getting the worst of these vicious exchanges, his corner would have said, yeah, use your reach, you know, and your height and move around a little bit. Yeah. And, and, but they were saying, him, you know, stuff like take it to him, show him your power. Uh, I would have fired all of those guys. You, I mean, what are they thinking? Gotta if make adjustments. Guys like you and me, we don't profess to be trainers. If we can see that a fighter is using the wrong tactics and getting the crap beat out of him, and then the corners tell him to keep doing what he's doing, uh, that sort of upsets me. But it was a great fight. Uh, and I think Ancanas, you know, that was his 10th title to fights. Right. He's had a lot of fights. And I, I think, you know, he's obviously no. The more fights you have, the more you lose a little something. And uh, but uh, yeah, he fought the wrong fight, and uh, you know Martinez was glad he did. Uh, the other one uh, with Garcia and Colbert, uh, that was really that was no contest. I mean, I think maybe I yes. go Colbert two rounds or something like that, and I couldn't understand why what he was doing. He's standing there like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> And Garcia is whipping his right hand around this, you know, I don't know. He, why did he just, he's a, he's a young guy with fresh legs and he just stood there. It was almost like, I don't know. And he was very gracious afterwards and admit that he lost and all that crap, but <laughs> it almost looked a little fishy, but I don't think it was, you no, know, I don't think so either. If, I, if I, you're going to take a dive or something like that, you're not going to take all that punishment. Uh, yeah. So I, I was really surprised. I think a lot of it is like this guy was from the Dominican Republic, right? Uh, Garcia. Yes. I think that's one of the poorest countries in the Caribbean, if not the poorest. And um, that's where tough fighters come from. And uh, the guy didn't look like, you know, fantastic fighter but he knew what to do and as soon as he realized this guy was just going to stand there he blasted the crap out of him that wasn't even close uh i love upsets you know and uh -huh. i think also these guys like colbert that had what do you have 12 fights something like that and they're already calling him you know the next great whatever that's stupid i agree man i mean we well, hey let the, let's wait and see a little bit before you know you put him in the hall of fame well, again, that's why as promising as Russell has looked, I'm like, Postal's been there. And, you know, I, I felt had enough skill, even at 38, to be a serious test. And I was really mad at the stoppage because I, I certainly, it was the last round. Postal had done enough that he was effective when yeah. he was punching. And it really, I, again, it's like, don't hand this shit to these kids. Yeah, he was it. not taking a terrible beating. He no. was losing almost every round, but he wasn't getting the crap beat out. He's a very good defensive fighter. He just can't punch, and he's getting old, and yeah. he's shot worn. So, you know, that's what it was. And that's why he was in there, by the way. Totally. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. A um, safe, a safe one, guess. <laughs> the other two guys that were supposed to win, I, you know, those are – well, I, actually, what is in, uh, Hector Garcia a uh, sub? Yes, he was. Yep. Boy, he was in great shape. I remember a couple of times going to his corner between rounds uh, when the, uh, you know, late in the fight. And his corner was saying, you're fighting on heart now. And I guess that was the truth. I mean, two, two, uh, two weeks. And they always say, oh, I was training for another fight. But that's, that's not quite the same thing. But, uh, yeah, uh, Garcia really took advantage of the situation. And that's what you've got to do. And now... At least he's lined up for another big payday. A hundred percent, absolutely, yep. and and a great performance. I missed I missed Sunday's cruiserweight fight. Did you watch it? No. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> we have enough on Saturday. Indeed, I, I let hear me, you. Let me give you a tip to some people that haven't figured this out already. When it's a Dan show, uh, and there's like you know, it starts at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon over there, or something like that. And uh, they have all these fights. Most all of them are terrible, one-sided, build your record up fights. Yep. I won't turn it on until the main events come sure. out. And, you know, not wasting hours. And then they had this weird thing in between 
fights, there's dead silence, which is okay, but sometimes it goes on 15 minutes. Uh, you know, bring the next guy out. What the hell are you doing? Well, and 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 truly, the, another reason why I wanted to talk to you uh, sooner than later, Nigel, is to to point out the obvious can, national world concerns about Ukraine and how it's impacting boxing. And frankly, I was really angry on Saturday. Well, really starting on Friday, ESPN has a weekly boxing show. Right. And, and it's a half hour show. And right. for them to not have a single segment yeah. about what's happening in Ukraine and all of the active and recently retired fighters that are from the Ukraine and not acknowledge it in any segment infuriated what, me. What network was that on? It was ESPN, and it was Max Keller. Well, now that I know, because uh, I tried to write some political articles for them when Manny Pacquiao, you know, uh, was him. And he's been in politics for quite a while now. Certainly. And uh, my editor said, oh, no, no politics. We can't do any politics. So I wrote it for somebody else. But <laughs> I wrote the British Boxing News. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the corporate mentality at ESPN. Wow. And if you look at the boxing coverage now, um, it's been weakened quite a bit. And none of those guys can write. Agreed. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm right. not bitter about being <laughs> not working there anymore. But uh, it, what's, what's sort of sad is that um, the executive that ran combat sports so that was boxing mma and wrestling uh he would always compliment me he knew i was a good writer but that didn't make any difference when they decided they needed to cut the budget so money is always more important than anything else uh, in, in sports yeah, yeah. especially well, in sports journalism you know i again i uh growing up as i did uh watching cosell uh, in the 70s, ABC wouldn't have ignored that. I mean, good Lord, think of all the, the politics involved with the Olympics and yeah, yeah. Ali in Vietnam and, and uh, you know, subsequent years. And I even want to talk about some other fighters that maybe we forget who uh, were as politically active as they were athletically active. Um, but uh, and also uh, HBO and Lampley. I don't think uh, I don't think they would have ignored the story. And it's, and again, it's a human story. I appreciate, I can yes, understand it to a degree, but it really is. And it, and it's, and it's, um, it's bigger than politics. I mean, I, I've, I said this when I was doing a show last night, um, this isn't a Republican or democratic issue. It's a democracy issue. And it's, it's what our country was literally founded on. And it's, it's like, especially you know, scary because so many former uh, democracies have turned into authoritarian states it's been happening all over the world. And perhaps this is the line to draw, to stop it. But, you know, my father fought in World War II. He's in, in the Royal Air Force. And I had an uncle that died there. My mother, she lived through the, all eight months of the Blitz when they bombed night and day. And um, luckily, uh, I bullshitted my way out of the Army, but uh, it wasn't... Defending your country is a lot different than attacking somebody else. And, of course, the United States, you know, I feel terrible for the Ukraine. I hope the Russians get their ass kicked. Uh, if I was over there, uh, I would fight. Uh, and I'm a pacifist, but this is no time to be a pacifist. And, but it also, it's the first or second thing I thought after being worried about the situation of the people is the United States invades countries all the time all Iraq, right afghanistan guatemala panama all we've been at war since the end of world war ii and we, the hypocrisy of some of these people that vote for these gigantic defense budgets uh well, i think it's 750 billion dollars this year um when you know they've got people living on the streets but I mean, you know, you always have to remember, we're we're far from saints. This country, hundred percent, man. Yeah, and so I think that I don't think many people have thought about that. Uh, but you know, it's it's just the way it is. I mean, I, I've heard some of the politicians um, on TV praising Putin. 
Yeah, and that's that's just disgusting. It really yeah, we didn't have anybody in England during the war that was praising Hitler or Mussolini. You know, it, uh, yeah. you know, it's just amazing. Uh, just let me just say this last, and I won't talk any more about politics. Okay. Um, I think the change uh, from democracies, and, and we're seeing it right here in our country. Um, my father's generation are all dead, practically. Yeah. I'm almost dead, which was the generation I was born in 1946, right after the war. I'll be dead soon, you know, not too soon, I hope. But I mean, this generation is dying out and that will leave nobody. You know, I mean, I can't have father, my father and my grandfather, they'd be fucking ripping their hair out. Um, but, you know, that. but there's, you know, all the people that, that were in the Holocaust, most of those are dead and, and yes. even their children. Yes. And even generation the memory gets less and less and less and you know that's what's happening i think if world war one I, I mean world war ii was just over uh in all, all those brave men who fought in it were still alive um we wouldn't be going through what we're going through in this country or what they're going through in england that's it <laughs> with, well no but i'm i'm with you man and honestly uh, again, I think the current conflict in Ukraine, it does impact boxing in a, in a huge way. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, you and I know, but, you know, really for people might need a scorecard to think about it. Lomachenko, Usyk, uh, uh, Postal, who who fought Saturday. Um, obviously, the Klitschko's. And, and also, I, mean, I was reminding friends that are casual fight fans. I'm like, you know, Vitaly has been uh, the, the mayor of Kiev you know, since like 2013 or 14. Yeah. And he's been well, in the thick of it, you know. I remember, you know, before, I don't know how many years ago, there were these pictures of him in some combat zone holding a pistol. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been rough over there for a while. Uh, but I tell you something. When you think about, I mean, they have, they have four of the greatest fighters that are active now, that you just named four of them. Really, you know, uh, even though Bidley is not a fighter anymore, when he was fighting, he was a great fighter, and sure. uh, he could probably beat the crap out of anybody today. <laughs> but Ukrainians are tough people. Yeah, yeah. They're they're not pussies over there. Uh, you're right. And um, I don't know. It was a terrible mistake to think that they were going to roll over. They're not. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. They're not going to roll. If you look at them, they look like strong people. You know, they're chunky with big heads. And <laughs> I don't know. That's probably silly what I'm saying. But every time they show these guys on TV, I say, well, look at that guy. You know, uh, and of course, there, there are so many beautiful women in the Ukraine, but uh, they'll be out there throwing Molotov cocktails, too. There was a, a picture I saw, maybe you saw it on the Internet, of a, a woman who had been uh, Miss Ukraine. I mean, she's a gorgeous woman. There she is with a Kalashnikov and, you know, her, her bulletproof vest on. So, you know, if you can fight, they're going to fight. Bill Maher had a video of a woman accosting Russian soldiers and, I guess, sunflowers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. And she handed him sunflower seeds and is like, hey, keep, the, keep these in your pocket because when you die – the sunflowers are going to grow out of your pockets. And she's just in their face like an, <laughs> like an angry lady in the street complaining about somebody making too much noise in their neighborhood. Yeah, she, and it was she, so she fantastic. Was right. yeah. And also, I mean, it, I mean, and I, I, I appreciate that those Russian individual sh soldiers showed enough restraint to not be assholes. And, and they're like, okay, we know, sorry. You know I mean? Literally kind of like, Hey, it's not it. You know, we're, we're in the army. We got to go where they tell us you to know go. The truth is, it's very interesting. Soldiers in war. Well, I'm not talking about the commandos or the seals or those heavy duty people that want to be warriors. Um, I just finished rereading the Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Cray. And, you know, sure. he was never in combat. He never saw combat. Oh but wow! His, his mind was amazing. And one of the things that came out, and I've heard it before. You're not fighting. You're not trying to hate. You didn't hate the South or the Germans or the Russians, whoever the enemy is. You're fighting to protect your buddies and yourself. And I think most of the uh, they haven't sent the 
you know, the best troops from Russia in yet, I don't think. But um, they don't want to be there. No. Really. They don't. Nobody wants to be at war, you know, and, and yeah. unless I say you're a professional warrior. Uh, and, uh, you know, I feel sorry for the Russians in a way, you know, that they're in the army and they either got to do what they're told to do or they're going to shoot them. Yeah. You know? So, um I think maybe those guys sort of thought that old lady was right, <laughs> you know? Totally. Absolutely, man. No, and that, that's why it was it was a real human moment in this insanity. Yeah, it was speaking truth to power in the in the scariest way. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And and like I said, I wanted to talk about uh, older uh, examples. Oh, no, I got of, a list of them here. <laughs> oh, awesome, man. I, I was hoping to, and I, and I figured you were going to have a much bigger list than what I could well, come up with. What I'd like to do is separate two different groups of fighters that uh, were involved in World War II. You had your Joe Lewis's and the Sugar Ray Robinson's who basically went around boxing exhibitions. They weren't in combat. There were others like that too. I think maybe Billy Kahn did a lot of that. I know that uh, Bob Montgomery and um, uh, Bojack they they donated their entire purse for one of their fights. I don't. They were in the service, but I don't know what they were doing other than that. Okay. But now, then you want to get around to something I discovered when I interviewed him when he was practically on his deathbed. Joe Brown, the old light uh, lightweight champion. Absolutely. Um, I interviewed him the year he was sworn into the International Boxing Hall of Fame, and he didn't live long after that. But he was his mind was great. He was in the Navy in the Pacific involved in seven different invasions. No, but not many people talk about that. That's no. Joe Brown or Barney Ross. He was, was going yes. now badly wounded. They got him hooked on morphine yeah. and, and, and guys like um, uh, Lou Jenkins. Sure. The other fighters. He, yes. he, he earned many commendations. So you have two groups. You got the PR group, which are usually the big famous names. And even though, you know, some of the guys I've just mentioned were famous. Of course, Joe Brown was wasn't lightweight champion, but I think Barney Ross was already retired, I think, when when he I believe him. that's correct. Yeah. Yes. So um, you know, there's there's two groups. <laughs> and uh, I think that um if you're in Crane, they're all in Ukraine, they're all in the same group. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Matt Schmelling, uh, a reluctant, yeah, exactly. reluctant German uh, soldier. And I think the uh, and and I at least that is again uh, being my age. That's how I always heard the story. That even though at the height of the 30s, Hitler certainly promoted him, but when he lost to Lewis, you know, he was wasn't he a parachuter or whatever? Yeah, they they sent him to the most dangerous job, and he he fought him by surviving and becoming a millionaire because he had the Coca Cola franchise. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Story. I mean. <laughs> Coca was more American than Coca Cola, you know. And also, and also his grand gestures to Joe Lewis, yeah, uh, and that and that wonderful friendship that yeah, you know, I, I think Schmeling used Hitler uh, because you know he could facilitate different things for him, um, and I think he was a person, and many people like this that enjoy being around power. Not, they're not just groupies exactly, but it's something similar, you know. Um, but, you know, it is true that uh, Max uh, saved some children um, by hiding them in, in his house. I don't, I, he was never in the Nazi party. Um, I'm going to give him a pass to a certain degree. Sure. Because I, I think deep down inside, he was a good man. Seemed like it, absolutely. In a bad situation, which he did take advantage of. But uh, I think any boxer will do damn near anything they can to be, in, you know, to work their way up to the heavyweight championship or something like that, you know, because it's so hard. There's only one champ back then, you know, any division. A, a, um, a few years earlier, uh, Carpentier was, uh, wasn't he a World War I hero? Uh, I'm, yes, he was. He was highly decorated in World War I. Um, he, uh, well, he was boxing before the war. And then he had the war. He was popular before, but after the war, he was like Mr. France. You know, he was the most popular guy in the, in the country. Even after he suffered, you know, Dempsey knocked him out and Seeky knocked him out. Even up until his death, he was like royalty in France. 
and he and then a big contrast to Dempsey, the deserter of uh, of war, or you know, didn't didn't fight in World War One, and then certainly was eligible to. In, in who, who are you talking about? Jack Dempsey. Am I right? Was oh yeah, he? Jack Dempsey. Yeah, you know that was a very strange thing that Dempsey. Um, years ago, when I was running the ring, out of nowhere. A guy wrote to me, or I think he was his secretary wrote to me, and he said he has this story about Jack Dempsey. And um, I said, well, we got a lot of stories about Jack Dempsey. I would just send it in, and if I like it, I'll pay you for it. It was fantastic. It focused on the trial. He had a trial. He was on trial um, for, I think, was it that? Sort of like Jack Johnson, the Man Act, and uh, okay, yeah, oh. he pimped his first wife, Jack Dempsey did, and I think why well, she he married her to avoid the law, but um, he he had that I can't even remember the guy's name, but uh, he won a wonderful story uh, with all the truth. Yeah, Jack Dempsey's image was really cleaned up. And, uh, you know, he sort of grew into a gentleman, especially after he uh, retired. But, uh, hey, man, he was a, he was a, he was a pimp. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. He was, you know, iceberg slim, but he, <laughs> he, he, was doing, he was doing that out there, you know, in the West and, and stuff. Yeah, like, rough and ready and, life. And, yeah. Yeah, a real survival life uh, prior yeah. to getting his act together in boxing. I, I'm sure if he'd have gone down and say, I want to sign up, they would have taken him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and he was married to a movie star. And yes. Down, down, Estelle. Down. Estelle. Yeah. Estelle was right. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember her last name. I, uh, I, you know, uh, 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago, it was 2002. I, uh, for the 75th anniversary of the long count, I was working at sporting news radio and I did a half hour audio documentary. Wow. And uh, I had uh, Studs Terkel on because he was 14 in Chicago listening to the fight uh, uh-huh. with his brothers and stuff. And and he had interviewed uh, Kearns, Doc Kearns. Uh-huh. And, uh, and also I talked to a guy, Jack Cavanaugh, who wrote a, a Tony biography and Roger mm-hmm. Kahn, who did an excellent Dempsey biography as well. And well, you uh, had quite a cast there for that show. No, uh, they, they, they paid attention. It was Sporting News Radio Network. So yeah. thankfully, the magazine I think had enough cachet that I was able to get these guys on and stuff. Well, Doc Kearns was dead by then, right? Oh, absolutely. But I, I was mentioning Doc Kearns. Yeah, looking at it now, I I haven't cracked it open yet, but I bought a used copy of his Million Dollar Gate book. Yeah, I have a copy here. Yeah. How is that book? Is it? A, is it? A... Well, I haven't read it in for a while. I read it a long time ago. Sure. But I have referred to it. Uh, look, you know, whenever I do a historical piece, uh, most of the people you want to day quote are dead, right? So I go to their biographies or other books that were written about them, and uh, you know, uh, Kearns, you know, he he has great quotes. You know, he was a fun sure. guy. You know, uh, and uh, he, uh, well, he, you know, he went all the way from Jack Dempsey to like Archie Moore. I mean, he he was in it for a long time, and Joey Maxim too, absolutely, yeah, Joey yeah. Maxim, yeah. No, and in fact, um, uh, Studs Terkel told me that in the 50s he had interviewed Kearns yeah. and stuff and said he was quite a character and everything. Yeah, and then was. also I uh, I spoke to Bud Schulberg, who uh, who knew Jack Dempsey as a, as when he was a young man and his father was running, uh, was he Universal? One of the major movie studios. Oh, yeah. So interesting. he said Jack was a family friend and he knew him and stuff, so. Yeah, I was, I was pretty I lucky. I want to go back to something I forgot to say about when you were talking about the, the fighters in the war. Certainly. In World War I, there was, there was a, a, a guy that was a former flyweight champion. His name was Victor Perez. Okay. He was Jewish. And um, the Nazis caught him and put him in Auschwitz. As the uh, Allies were closing in, on Auschwitz. They hadn't got there yet. They tried to get everybody out of there. And it was a forced march and terrible weather. And like it was a thousand guys and only about a hundred survived. And he was one of the guys that survived. And I forget the camp he was in then, but a guard shot him for distributing food to his fellow captives. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
killed him or a lot of people forget him because World War One was a long time ago. But yeah. I know all boxing hysterians will know who I'm talking about now. And and did, was he fatally shattered? Well, did the oh yeah, he killed him. They he killed him. Him. Wow. Wow. And he was distributing bread or other food. Uh, I don't know. That, that doesn't seem like something they should kill you for. But yeah, they shot him. Actually, they wanted to get rid of as many of the people that were still alive from the concentration camps before the Allies got to them. Uh, you know, because they yeah. they could testify, yeah. not just part of a pyramid of bodies. But uh, we got a lot of the bad guys anyway in Nuremberg. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we those guys. Absolutely. How about now, more recent uh, political boxers? Um, I, I used to talk with uh, Bert Sugar about uh, Dick Tiger and yeah. the Afra and how and how politically active the the light heavyweight champion was back then. Yeah, well, I don't know if you read the issue of uh, Ringside Seat where I um, profiled Joe. I mean, uh, Dick Tiger. I missed it. Please tell me. Uh, well, you know, he was a hero of mine as a kid from watching it on TV. And, you know, there were a lot of guys that weren't that entertaining, like Joey Archer or the Moyer brothers, you know, they, they, they were good fighters, but they wasn't much action. Yeah. Um, so I, I fell in love with Dick Tiger, you know, knocking out guys on TV. And um, I went from the beginning of his career, well, actually from his childhood up until he, he died. Yeah. And um, his situation in Nigeria was untenable. Basically, because when Biafra broke away, and the reason they broke away is that genocide was being perpetrated on him by the more northern people in the country. Yes. And um, so, you know, he went with his people and um, he he won an award, one of those things from the Queen. Uh, you know, they, they have the awards every year. Something of the British Empire. Yeah, Order of the British uh, Empire, things like that. He so, mailed it back to her. Wow. And, and he got the idea from John Lennon. He, you know, John Lennon did that, and Dick Tiger says, oh, I'm going to do that too. And there's wow. a great, there's a great uh, column written about, uh, I forget who the writer was, that went with, with him to the post office to mail the thing. Holy shit. So, yeah. so um Dick Tiger was not just a great fighter. He was a great man. Um, one of his title defenses took place during the war. And, um, well, the thing before I go on about the Brits are, they were supplying all the arms for the people that were fighting against Bayou, yeah. the other part of Nigeria, the Nigeria yes. company. Why? Because they wanted the money. Uh, so, I think it was, uh, was it Roger Rouse? He was a, he was a light heavyweight contender. And, but the offer was completely encircled by government troops. And uh, he snuck out by an old jungle trail. <laughs> it just wow. showed him, it's like Tarzan or something. Yeah. He, 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 he went on this jungle trail and um, he went to an island that was owned by the Portuguese. And he got to that island, then he got to Lisbon, and then he flew to New York, and then he flew to Las Vegas, knocked out Roger Russ, Roger Rouse, rather, and came back. Well, that's the kind of guy he was. And um, he was a very noble person, you know. Uh, he left his village uh, when he was like, you know, a young man. And they went to the nearest town, him and his brother. And they only had like one water fountain. <laughs> and when it was just like a, a mob scene around to get water. But everybody stood aside for Dick Tucker because he had a, a street fighting reputation. And, you know, he had all those fights in, in Africa before he actually went to England. And, um, and then to the United States. And it was a long, long journey for Dick Tiger. And he died young. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a, uh, a description in a biography uh, about him that, uh, that I used. Um, his funeral. Um, he was laid in state uh, in this city. Um, they called it in the mansion. I don't know what it was. But he was there for days and days as 
but people just pass through, you know, to pay tribute. And when the actual funeral came, the roads were so crowded that the uh, it had to go really slow from, you know, wherever he was to where he was going to be buried, from the church. It was from the church to the burial ground. Uh, every There were people in trees, people standing on top of cars. Uh, it was a, a really mob scene, but nobody was violent. They were there to celebrate this great man. And people talk about Azuma Nelson, who was a great fighter, but Dick Tiger's the greatest fighter ever come out of Africa. He was the light heavyweight champion and the middleweight champion when That's there right. was only one. And he fought all the badasses. Absolutely. He even even gave Joey Giardello a shot and Joey beat him. And then he had a return match and beat Joey. And Joey was one of those guys that was getting old. He'd never, you know, he had that shot with Fulmer when they were both butting the hell out of each other. (laughs) uh, (laughs) And I tell you, there was a guy called Jersey Jones who was like a publicist slash, I don't know, insider who was technically his, uh, his manager. And um, he, he told this story. He said that um, even right near the end of his career, Dick Tiger was learning to be better. Like he'd finally learned how to step between the jab and the right hand. That's very hard, but that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to run away or back. Certainly don't back up straight or step around. If you're an aggressive fighter, you can get between the jab. I'm with you. And, 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 you know, so he was a, a student of the game and of course, very sad uh, when he, when he got cancer, yeah, he, he, he couldn't fight anymore. He worked in a museum in New York as a guard and um, he finally got permission. The Warren Biafra was over. He finally got permission to return to Nigeria by the Nigerian government. Yes. And he had to go to the consulate or whatever, uh, the ambassador in New York, probably. And he didn't trust them. You know, oh, yeah, going to be fine. He took Larry Merchant with him. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He, Larry Merchant was probably the, the, the sports editor. The, I think it was the, the, the New York Daily News there. He'd left Philadelphia. Yes. And um, he took Larry with him because he knew uh, Larry was a very influential person, and he Larry didn't have to say anything. He wanted him as a witness, and he did. He did. We didn't have any trouble getting back, but everything that he'd owned was gone. Um, he was a very frugal guy, <laughs> really frugal. He, he uh, sometimes he had his gym equipment in a paper bag. Wow. You know, he's a champion of the world. Um, he sent all of his money, except living expenses, back home to his wife. Yeah. And they bought all sorts of businesses. I, you know, stuff from like movie houses to like beauty shops and land and everything. Uh, he would have been really in great shape. Um, he did get some of it back. It took a long, well, he was dead. But I mean, the family did get some of the property back, but certainly not all of it. Wow. Um, so, uh, and yeah, you know, there, there was another guy that uh, I, I knew who, who wrote a, uh, a biography. It was uh, written for children. He was a Nigerian that was living in this country. And um, he was very upset that children in Africa or Nigeria didn't know who Dick Tiger was. Uh, so, he was published by a African publishing company based here in the United States, but that was their specialty to get stuff for, for children. And, and he wrote this book <laughs> and um, he had a book launch at the uh, um, United Nations. Wow. And I was invited. <laughs> it was a funny experience. Um, I'm there in this big room with maybe three or 400 Nigerians and they're like all stone faced looking at me. Who the hell is this guy? Sure. And uh, so I cracked a joke. Uh, I said, "Oh, it's so good to see all these happy faces." But they didn't get they didn't get the sarcasm. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, it did help. I mean, even at that point in the eighties, or maybe it was in the nineties, I can't remember. Um, 
the Nigerian government didn't want to recognize Dick Tiger. It was just slowly, slowly he was like being recognized. And this book was an effort to, you know, to move this along. Because if if you tell kids stuff, they're going to remember it. You know, yeah. Something like that. So uh, Dick Tiger, for me, was a hero in and out of the ring. And uh, he, he was really something. Well, like I said, I, I had many conversations about him with Bert Sugar when I was writing for him. For did Rock he say a lot of the same things I did? Absolutely, man. No, no, no. And and I know, I wish I could remember whether it was an article, might have been in Boxing Illustrated, might have been in uh, Ring, might have yeah. been when you were when you were editing Ring. But uh, it, his story intrigued me. And, I and you know, yeah, I mean, uh, one of my favorite things, much like we're doing right now, was to, when, when Bert and I would get together was pick his brain about, you know, some of the guys yeah. that I only knew as and a name. Bert knew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bert knew. Yeah. He, uh, Bert was a remarkable person. Um, yeah. I'm very glad he was in my life. Me I'm too. very glad he gave me my first time boxing job. Uh, I remember when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, they do that on Sunday, the last day of the three or four day thing. And uh, when I mentioned my gratitude to Bert uh, for giving me my first job. But it was like, almost like a, it wasn't a standing ovation, but the people in the crowd went nuts. Oh, Bert that's great. Well remembered and loved. Yeah. You know, yeah. quite a bit after his death. Being being his wingman a few times at uh, <laughs> Vegas, Vegas shows, I can speak from that yeah, experience. Did you have to keep up with him drinking? Oh, well, I, I didn't I, I didn't go shot for shot with them, no. but I would be like, it would be three in the morning Vegas time. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, Bert, I got to go to bed. And he's like, I'm staying up. I got to be on Good Morning America. Yeah. 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 He, uh, yeah. Whenever I drank with him, I, I, every three or four he had, I'd have one. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and, and also we'd run into celebrities and they all knew Bert. Yeah, that's my kid from Chicago. He writes for me and everything. That's here's, here's a little quick story about everybody knowing Bert. Sure, it was the second fight between Saab Muhammad and uh, Kawi at the Spectrum in Philly. So Bert was in town for the fight, and I was like the guy that you know, drove him around and shit. Um, that's when I was like kissing his butt to get a job, basically. Sure, but it was fun. Um, yeah. After the fight, and you go to the press conference and get the hell out of the parking lot. It was gone two o'clock when all the bars closed. And when Bert doesn't have anything to drink, he gets really rammy. Did you ever see that? <laughs> so he's going nuts, right? And I'm his sidekick. Sure. Um, I, so I knew that if we went over to Jersey, they'd be still be open. So we went over, I don't know how familiar <laughs> with Jersey. We went over, um, I think it was the Ben Franklin Bridge. Okay. which took you right into Camden and Admiral Wilson Boulevard, where the hookers used to be. <laughs> and there were a lot of like strip clubs. So there, there were bars and strip clubs. <laughs> I pulled into the first one, right? Because I don't want to drive a long way. And we went in and Bert bellied up to the bar, ordered two six packs. And suddenly the girl dancers were all around Bert. Oh, you're Brooke Sugar. We just saw the fight on TV and all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, here's, here's, you know, guys, the girls that are uh, dancing, pole dancers, and they knew who Bert was. <laughs> of course they did. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. He never turned down an autograph. He never would not even stand there and talk to a, uh, to a fan. He didn't care who it was. You could be HBO, NBC, or just some guy that managed to squeeze into the fight on a cheap seat. He was their friend. Yes. And I think that was his greatest talent. I completely agree. Master, master Schmoozer. Absolutely. Master. Master. No question. No question. We did a we did a trade show here in Chicago for mom and pop grocery stores, like bodegas, basically. Yeah. And um he was there. Um, he had his hundred greatest boxers of all time book. Yeah, I got the book. And Leon, Leon Spinks was still living here. Mm -hmm. So uh they had a two hour autograph session at the Warner book booth. Uh -huh. And then after that, we could just walk the show. And we ran into John Havlicek was there for, uh, I want to say skull and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like chewing tobacco and Steve Miserak and um, the, the, the blonde woman, the original Ula from the producers movie, Lee Meredith. 
Because oh, yeah? she, she and Miseret, well, she was in light beer commercials with right. Mickey Spillane as like his gun mall. Right. And Miseret did light beer commercials. So they were there for light beer. And then um, Suzanne Summers was there with the Thigh Master, which was ridiculous, but she was there. <laughs> and finally, we're walking by the Nabisco booth. Right. And big thing for Ritz uh, crackers, I want to say. Right. And we hear this unmistakable voice go, Hey, Leon. And all three of us turn, and in unison, like a bad beach movie, we go, "Hey, it's Chubby Checker," and it was, and it was, and, and seriously, like as, as soon as, and then so Leon rushes over because I guess there's a, I, 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 if Chubby was the St. Louis guy, but they knew each other, and they're shaking hands, and I turn to Bert, and I'm like, "When do we wind up in a Love Boat episode? How did this happen?" <laughs> And and we we had the best time. It was it was hilarious. Well, he was in that Robert De Niro boxing when Robert De Niro was a promoter. Night in the city. He, yeah, he was like a guy sitting at the bar. And yeah, he, he didn't have to act. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, I don't want to get too deep, but I guess I will. Um, Bert was a genius, but a flawed genius who oh, self destructed. Yeah. Yes. Many, many very bright people are like that. Um, I don't know exactly why, but he would sabotage himself over and over. And I was a young kid. You know, I wasn't as hip as he was to a lot of things, but I could see it. You me know, too, no, and, I know you and it helped me because they fired his ass, <laughs> you know, and I got I got his job eventually. Sure. So, sure. But really, Bert uh, was self-destructive. I hear and, you, man. Uh, yeah. And um, but if he hadn't been like that, he probably wouldn't have been the character he was. So there's 100%. always a trade off. There's always a trade off. Like a yeah. boxer is the greatest trade off. Uh, even though they're all in denial, they're all going to get brain damage. And, you know, uh it's just one of those things, self-destruction, you know? No, it's, it really is. You're right. And it, it's, uh, I, I, sometimes the flaws are part of being endearing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. I'm we glad I. Love, we all love crazy people because they're a lot of fun. Yes. I like, you know, I, did you ever read the, you read the piece about uh, when I was a manager, front man? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well. The one fighter that I had, uh, Jerome Artis, he uh, beat Sugar Ray Leonard in the Golden Gloves. He was a good fighter, but he was, you know, I think, you know, the old saying, a uh, million dollar talent with a dime's worth of dedication. Right. Yeah. And that's what he was. Well, I I stayed friendly with him, even though he was a total fuck up. Um, and he, he, he never got as much out of his career as he should have. Uh, you know, he was just a wild man. Um, he was intelligent. Um, and you know, it's like, geez, he was self-destructive, you know? Uh, but I, because I stayed with him because he was fun to be with. Now that sounds crazy, but I, if you want to go back and look when, uh, we were signed, me and Russell were signing up these fighters and I was up at a gym at 26 and master street Russell Pelt, uh, yeah. watching uh, some other fighters and he sidled up next to me. I didn't even see him approaching and sat down and said, hey, I hear we're going to work together. And he, it was very obvious he was trying to ingratiate himself with me. And most times that I wouldn't like that. But I liked him right away. And I never disliked him regardless of what he did. And, you know, he did a lot of bad things. And, uh, but I guess it was just because he was fun to be with. I mean, is that a sin? I don't think so. But uh, there are people like that. Uh, and I have had other friends that way. That uh, all con men have to have a good personality. <laughs> or, you can, or you can't be a good con man. I mean, that's, right. that's, that's one of the tools. The Absolutely. The most important tool. And uh, he was a con man. And I knew it. And I knew he was lying to me. But I didn't give a shit. I was having a lot of fun. I get it, man. No, I've, I've met people like that in broadcasting and... Oh, I'm sure. Uh, you know, again, yeah, I, uh, I, I hear you absolutely. Before we wrap, I really wanted, I wanted to acknowledge Alexis Arguello and his uh, political ties as well. And you know, that was kind of the start of when I was getting into boxing, and I didn't have as clear a picture of 
was 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 it during his career or after? His no, career? he retired. He became the mayor. Of, I think it was probably the capital. Um, and uh, I. This was the. This, is, this is, is my theory. This is my theory. Uh, unsubstantiated theory. He was basically a good person. I mean, you could tell that when he was over here. Oh yeah. God, yeah. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. Um, he got this job, and he realized all this corruption was going on. And uh, I think they murdered him. They didn't shoot. He didn't shoot himself with a shotgun. I, I'm pretty sure that he um, he knew too much. And a lot of guys get killed when they knew too much. Wow. And I think because he was an upstanding person who really cared about the people in this country, he didn't come from the aristocracy or anything. Uh, I think he was uh, really going, maybe he said something like, well, if you don't stop this, I'm going to tell everybody something like that. I, I don't know wow. exactly, but I, I don't think he, he killed himself. Uh, his son doesn't think he killed himself. Uh, I think that, you know, it was just, yeah, this guy knows too much. Bang. Yeah. But he, he, I, I covered his fight with Ray Mancini, which I personally believe, even though he got stopped, it was Mancini's greatest fight. Uh, he stayed with this guy. Uh, for you know a pretty long time yes before he got stopped and i never said that to ray <laughs> but uh he was inducted to the hall of fame the same year as me and, oh wow great he, he was the big draw not me <laughs> sure no 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 i understand <laughs> and, um uh you know i've always liked ray you know he how was not how can you like not ray mancini he oh, was yeah. really a great fighter but um yeah, he, uh, he 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 was a really sweetheart too. Uh, but you got some guys like that, and you know other guys like Floyd Mayweather. You know, they're, they're real crooks. Hundred <laughs> percent right, man. Yeah, I no, mean, you're... you know, um, Floyd changed. Uh, I remember when he just came out the Olympics, and he was yes, you know, running up a record. Uh, we did a photo shoot with him. He was just thrilled to death to have his picture taken by Ring magazine. And he was, he had a girl with him. I don't know who it was. And, um, you know, he, he was like very cooperative. Uh, but as the time went on, uh, those photo shoots, <laughs> really? they, they were murder when we could get one. Wow. Um, we did a cover with Floyd, the same as the Bert did with um, Tommy Hearns. We posed with the machine gun because he was pretty boy Floyd in the beginning sure. of the year. And we also wanted some classical post boxing shots. So uh, I wasn't there. Al Bello, who's a great photographer, works for Getty, who he started out with us, but he wow. works for Getty. Um, he wouldn't pose for any of those pictures. All he wanted to do is pose with his gangster outfit on. But and another time, oh, this was Pernell Whitaker. He was he was tricky too. Uh, really? Yeah, I, I think maybe it was a substance abuse. I don't really know. I know that he had it. Um, we arranged the, the photo shoot, and he had just been. Uh, I guess he had just become pound for pound number one in the ring, or something like that. And uh, went there, and all he would do for us is pose in this leather jacket that said. Pound for pound, number one. And he, we sort of had a cover shot. He's back to us looking over his shoulder. He wouldn't take his shirt off. He wouldn't do anything. So he, he was very um, prickly. Understood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jeez. Uh, and, I, was, uh, I was in the garden when he fought Trinidad. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, I liked him for I, I was never a big fan. I was always fair. When he came up for the Hall of Fame, I checked him off without even thinking about Oh, sure. It. I know how great he was. But boy, did he saw show balls in that fight! Absolutely, and that's I was I was there, and there were um, Trinidad fans behind me, and uh, like, come on, man, this guy ain't shit. And I turned around, I'm like, listen, <laughs> Felix is a great fighter, but come on, man. And he goes, the guy's like, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Trinidad legitimately won the fight, I think, but. Um, that was his last real big fight, I believe. I agree. And he bro had his jaw broken. And right. um, yes. Yeah. And um, I admired him more as a faded warrior standing up for 12 rounds about with a another future Hall of Famer. Yeah. That brought out the admiration for me that I never really had before. 
that I speak. I wrote an editorial about it. That, that I became sure I read it. A, a, a Pernell Whitaker fan at his worst moment. Well, I guess maybe the Chavez fight was his worst moment, but yeah, uh, yeah he was terribly robbed. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that's sort of strange. You know, you can't really control your emotions. And people that tell you they don't have certain favorites about boxers and guys they don't like, media people, they're all lying. You know, sure they're they lying. They're all human <laughs> beings, for Christ's sake. I mean, even a robot would probably have a favorite fighter. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, that was almost, uh, I don't know, it, it sort of changed me. Not just for him, but to realize that, you know, that, that, that was what changed me about him it was sort of weird, but um, I'm glad it did. I'm glad it did. And I was very sorry. He got, what, he got hit by a car crossing the street or something. That's how we died. Yeah. yeah. But and he was still a relatively young man. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Early yeah. 50s, I want to say. And I tell you, even though a lot of the media found uh, Purnell very critical, prickly uh, and uncooperative, all the boxers loved him because they knew how damn good he was. They were in yeah. awe of him. And, you know, no, I've never heard a boxer say a bad, or maybe an opponent going into the fight or something, you know, the normal crap. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, uh, I don't know. I think he could have been even greater than he was. And often people say, you know, well, uh, um, who was the better uh, defenses fighter? Uh, who's the better fighter? Pernod Whitaker or, or um, uh, Mayweather? Okay, yeah. And I always say, well, they're both great defensive fighters, but Mayweather was nowhere near as good an offensive fighter. Permel Whitaker didn't make you miss and clinch. He'd hit you. He wasn't a huge puncher. He had a couple of one-punch knockouts, you know, but he wasn't a huge hitter. But he just, he wasn't pure defense, you know. I mean, he was more – well. well the first half of Mayweather's career, I always look forward to his fights. Because when he, he was, was an offensive fighter. In a yeah. way, he was like, you know, a great seek and destroy fighter. And yes. I don't blame him. As the time went on, he, sure. he knew what was going to do to him. But, you know, he still didn't, wasn't any fun. But right. uh, Pernell Whitaker could fight a very defensive fight, which he always did. But he was also fun. He, he, would, with you. he would he would punch back against the other. And it wasn't jab, right hand, clinch, you know, it was combinations. So I would have to definitely rate Purnell above Mayweather as a fighter. I agree with you. And in fact, this past weekend, somebody had a photo of uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and uh, and, and Mayweather. Yeah. And my, my comment, you know, and they're like, who would win? And it's like, oh, no, no, no. Ray was much more of an offensive fighter. Oh, yeah, but was, it would have been fun to watch because he was, they would have, would have had no choice. He had a vicious fun. streak in him. He was like Mr. Madison Avenue, nice-looking guy. Everybody loved him. When that bell rang, he was a pure assassin. And that lad, that one of those last fights with Donnie Lalonde, remember that? Yes. Fight? Oh, of course. When Lalonde was put, they put him down, it was a great fight. When he finished him off, it was like going to the guillotine, man. It was really something when he finally got it. It I'm was like a fight that Holyfield had. Was it with Dokes? Where That was a great fight. Oh and he my ran God. after him as he was falling down and before he hit the canvas and nailed him again. You know, that's, that's you know, he was, Evander was an assassin too. I'm with you on that too. And I, when I finally, uh, Bert introduced me to uh, Buddy McGirt in the, um, was it the it was the early two thousands when Buddy was training yeah. and I and mentioning Whitaker and stuff immediately I'm like Buddy those two fights you had with Purnell I'm like I'm sorry you didn't win I was I was and I was rooting for Buddy but they were wars man and yeah. I mean and that really kind of he, he went, went in for the rematch with a bad shoulder that's right yes and uh, he had operation afterwards but the the doctor he went to must had it was a uh, told his trainer it was nothing. And his trainer told him. And, and I, I did a piece on Buddy when he uh, got in the Hall of Fame and we were talking about that. He said he finally knew that he was being screwed when they were driving to the fight for the weigh-in. And I forget who it was. Al Braverman, I guess. He was he was his manager. Al Braverman said, you know, you don't have to go with this through with this fight if you don't want to. On the way to the weigh-in, he's finally sort of telling him in a way 
You're not you know, I think his conscience uh, was bothering me a little bit, and he went he went ahead, and, and then had an operation. But uh, he was never quite the same after that injury. Wow. He, he was still a good fighter, but you know, <clears throat> Nigel, this is exactly the kind of conversation I hoped for. <laughs> I truly, I appreciate it, man. This uh... well, it's great to shoot the shit about boxing with somebody <laughs> else who knows about boxing. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a high compliment. I, I yeah, I yeah, genuinely I appreciate it. Well, that's great, man. And uh, you've got a great piece coming up in the latest uh, ringside seat. Yeah, I'm doing the Duran piece, and I also um, I have a, I always do a book review usually on George Dixon, who was the first black world champion. Period, and his life was brief. I just say this. He was the biggest black superstar in the 19th century. Wow. People don't realize how huge he was. Even John L. Sullivan loved him. Uh, but he was also an alcoholic, you know, and it led to his downfall. But uh, he was a fantastic fighter. And he not only was the first black world champion he was the vanguard of all the black fighters who would come after him to become world champion so uh anybody that reads ringside seat check out maybe you'll like the book and buy it i don't know that sounds great man yeah. no 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 and that's one of the reasons why i enjoy ringside seat is those b- book reviews and uh yeah. and again you guys I, i'm so glad that uh you're you're still writing with them because uh, oh, yeah. really, uh, Detloff and company have really assembled a great. Yeah. I mean, group basically, of a lot of it was the old ring kit. Yes, yes. So and that's actually, uh, I, I recently recruited a writer that I had not seen in about twenty years, but I admired. Uh, uh, he, he's writing for the new too. So it's uh, yeah, you know, get a little bit fresh, fresh writers, you know. Uh, it's always good. All right, That's we're going past our time. I'm running off my mouth. No, no. Uh, soon. Absolutely, man. No, in a couple of weeks, hopefully you'll join us with the rest of the ringside seat guys. We'll talk about the Durant piece. We'll talk about the Dixon review and more. But on, uh, as always, Nigel, really appreciate your time. So thanks All right. For I appreciate your show. <laughs> Bye-bye. Well, you're a good man. All right, be well. And everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, great stuff coming up on Word Balloon this week, as always. But until then, 